Good morning and a warm welcome to another virtual presentation of the U3A here in Hermanus. We are very fortunate to have Liesl de Villiers speak to us this morning on a big issue in our Hebron and Ari Valley, the, the fires that have raged there for quite a while. She is the Senior Environmental Manager in the Overstand Municipality in the Department of Environment. And she and with her team have been involved in this for quite a long time. So, warm welcome to you, Liesl, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Gerard. Yes, it's, it's quite an honor for me this morning to uh, be presenting to all of you. I'm going to just say that I'm not an expert in this field. The expert is from the National Department, is Pete Louis um, Grundling, Dr. Pete Louis Grundling, who has assisted us a lot with this um, wetland process restoration process and also Heidi Nivart, who is um, at the, the Western Capes um, Coordinator for the Working on Wetlands program. So I'll just start off jumping into the presentation to show the issues that we've had with our fires. So in 2018-2019, the Overberg fire season marked probably as one of the most overwhelming in the history of the Overberg. We had 30 wildfires burning during the season and 20 of these were extremely damaging to our area. You can see this is actually the, the, the France Kral fire that just popped up. A lot of people say that it was extremely damaging to our area and it was to our community, but it was not actually so damaging to the larger process of our fangle section. It was, as we all know, fangles actually wants fire to, to regenerate and um, if we don't manage our felt properly through block burns or managing our felt age with mosaic burns, then that can cause huge biodiversity loss through the increase of intensity of our burns and under the combined factors which was actually happened on that Friday which we call Black Friday, 11 January 2019, when all three fires in Betis Bay, Armanis, and in France was raging at one time, then those intensity of those fires, especially if you have an increase in your invasive species, that can have a detrimental impact on, on our flame boost. And as we know, the combination of, of that day was we had a very dry spell, we had high winds, and like I said, the infestation cause a lot of impacts on our urban area. The site that I'm going to talk about today is, like I said, the Ormus catchment, specifically zooming into the peat wetland. And you can see there there's a light yellow patch that is actually the, the size of the wetland that we are concentrating on. And this is just a zo zooming into that, the Ormus River. Um, it's a very unique system. First of all, it's a palmite system. And it's, um, for meat systems are very unique to our Western Cape wetland systems. And secondly, it's a peat dominated system. And if you put peat and palm meat together into one system, you have an extremely unique system that is very rare across our country. The area that is green, just want to show you with the mouse, that was an, what we call an intact peat wetland that was not affected by the fire. And the yellow section at the bottom was actually really more heavily affected by the fire. If you note at the bottom here, you'll see there's a different color um, between the green patch and the yellow patch. And that's because the yellow patch is actually heavily invaded with black wattle and um, blue gum trees. And um, in a normal fire system, what happens is that when a fire jumps through and it goes into your um, whole meat, Wetland, then normally the, the palmite is adapted that the fire just rushes over it. It doesn't really um, penetrate into the soil, but when you have invasive species, then it's a different story. Then um, the, the intensity of the fire, the large root systems of those trees actually gives the opportunity for the fire to move into the soil and then, and then burn basically underneath into the soil. This is um, one of the earliest photographs. Most of the photographs are mine. Um, some of the photographs on the presentation also belongs to Rob, Rob Erasmus from, um, from the wildfire. Um, and he is 
basically a firefighter, but with lots of experience regarding um, fire mapping, etc. So the poor condition of this section of the weekend um, is basically because of historical, poor historical farming practices. Of course, the, the boss dam that was built in 1975 also had a large impact on the natural flow of the system, a lot of water that in the wetland system that was removed. The, there's a lot of illegal water abstraction through the agricultural processes with illegal dams upstream. Like I said, the invasive plants on both private and municipal property. There was historical roads built in this wetland system, two roads that actually run through the wetland system. Um, there's also historical funding um, where the, the Campbell Farm and some of the other areas historically used to be um, fruit orchards and they basically went into the river system and dammed up areas to, to irrigate um, these, these specific um, orchards. There's also lots of gabions, stormwater pipes um, and some other unnatural systems or structures rather that um, causes uh, cause a lot of damage to the system so that the peat and the soil actually dried out. So as mentioned before, the um, fire of 11 January burnt into the wetland system. What happened, like I mentioned, they quickly burnt over the palm meat, but when the invasive trees caught a light in the foot end of the wetland, um, it burned underground into the soil. Now, on the 22nd of January, now this is um, about 11 days later, the fire department contacted the environmental section to ask for assistance. They did not understand what they were looking at. They couldn't understand why they couldn't kill this fire. Um, and they saw that there was a lot of smoke and heat that was raising from beneath, um, coming up from beneath the ground. The ground was full of cracks, as you can see on the photographs. Um, and the smoke and the steam and even toxic air was, uh, um, was being released out of these cracks. The smoke and the toxic smell from the cracks was so pungent that the nearby Campbell School and community actually had to be evacuated um, and they couldn't return to their um, accommodation after the fire for quite some time. Um, they actually only returned again after July when the site was found more safe. So when I arrived on the site, um, I walked onto the site and I could smell, I could actually smell the sulfur, the methane and the CO2 being released into the air. It was a distinctive smell for me of a very smoky peat whiskey and then I knew we were dealing with a peat fire. My team was not experienced at all in these type of fires and we immediately contacted the ex experts or the specialists. Um, so Dr. Pete Louis Grinning from the National Department of Environmental Affairs um, said that he would come down. He visited the site on 22 November and then he visited again on the 4th and the 5th of March and a couple of times after that. But these initial visits were to basically identify if we had a presence of peat in the system and how we could measure it. So what you see on the screen is actually a, 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 called a Russian peat auger or a soil auger, but it's a special auger to bring these cores. Um, of peat um, up to the surface. At that point, he had a seven meter peat auger with him um, to see how deep we could, the peat was actually um, extended down into the soil. And what you can see here is the layers of the soil as we went down into the earth. You can see here's more, um, more muddy um, and that was more to the surface. Um, and this one, I'm actually, turning, I'm actually moving backwards up and then there is a lot of plant material as you come through up higher onto the, towards the farm meat. And then over here, it shows you almost like a history if you look at it. Um, it shows you all the different layers, shows what happened in the past and um, in this system. And this white sections over here um, is normally the sand deposits that um, comes, flash floods that come down. Um, and then these muddy, is, is more of your uh, deeper soils or your more fertile soils that, uh, that come down with floods. So um, we found in these cores that there was actually a fire before in the system because we found burnt sticks and bark in, in the soil. We also found, like I mentioned, evidence of flooding that brought the sand and the muddy deposits down from the system. 
we also found that the deepest layer of the soil was filled with sedges and not barmeat, so it was grasses, which means that it was a complete different system many, many thousands of years ago. So this is what you're looking at. That's a peat with some sedge um, in, in the soil. And um, Pete Louis said it was such a it's such an old system and at seven meters that the system could be between 10,000 and 12,000 years old and he knew when he put down the deepest part of the of the peat auger at seven meters that we could actually go down further but he didn't have all his um, connections with him because he's got about a 30 meter peat auger that he can go down into the soil, but they wouldn't allow him with all this um, with all this implementation on the plane at that point. So he had to only bring half of that with him. So we knew that there was more um, behind the uh, under the under the ground. We could also establish that the system was combined farm meat and older sedge radisol peatland systems, which was in a seemingly V-shaped valley bottom system, which is also very very unique um, for for this area. Uh, Dr. Pete Louis also mentioned that according to his knowledge, that was the first time that such a phenomenon where you find both the different layers of peat and the V-shaped valley bottom is found. So in June 2020, Dr. Pete Louis visited the site again and brought along his longer extensions because he drove down this time. And at 12.5 meters, he um, got to the end of the peat layer. So at the bottom of the peat layer, they found very coarse sand, and that was that was obviously the first layers, thousands and thousands of years old um, or ago of, of this river system. And according to Dr. Pete Louis, this is the third deepest peak wetland measured in our country. Sorry for the stretch of this photograph. Um, I wanted it to fit in, but it, at least it gives you an idea of um, what happened on the site, what it looked like after the fire. Um, you can see that there's some water still on the system. This is the intact part of the wetland that you're looking at. So the intact part, the top part, was still, still in a good condition. And in the, in the background, you can see some of the green um, leaves of the, of the palm meat restoring itself. Now, peatlands have been in the spotlight for some time for their role in climate change, both as a carbon sink and also as methane sources. So methane is produced naturally in the low oxygen environments of peatlands. Um, it's pro methane production is accelerated even more in areas dominated by sedges, like in this case, grass-like plants that exclude more easy, easily altered forms of dissolved oxygen carbon from, from their roots. So obviously in the climate change context, it's extremely important to keep our, these peatland wetland systems intact because they are our carbon sinks that keep our ecosystems and our own environment um, safe. So when our peat actually burns, it emits this carbon dioxide, methane and sulfates into the air. The smoldering of the dense organic soil produces heavy smoke that can remain low in the atmosphere for long periods. And it, cre it creates visibility hazards. And like I said, um, it's very threatening to the health of our local communities. And, the, and this specifically in the Ormus was one of the showcases, exactly what happened here. So when our peatlands are dried out because of these increased invasives, the cutting off of the water supply through illegal abstraction of water, or even the previous fires, like I mentioned, the soil becomes dry and full of cracks and holes. Now the dried out peatland then becomes very susceptible to fires and further erosion. The fires of the Omris therefore easily spread underground around through the cracks and it fueled to burn even hotter and deeper under the fire um, un, un, until the fire fighting techniques for surface fires um, is not successful anymore. I just wanted to show you the tools that was used. What we did is we knew that we had to do something, but we didn't really know how to do it. So we first started with a plan to map the underground fire. Now, Ravi Rasmus and, and Kim from the Enviro Wildfire Solutions suggested the mapping through the use of the drone fixed with a heat detecting or thermal camera. You can see there's the drone. It's a little piece of, little, small piece of equipment, but it did, it did an amazing job. The camera 
can't detect the underground fire, but it could detect heat emanating from the ground for at, um, for at least, or to at least up to 30 centimeters deep. So the following is what we saw through the eye of the camera from 100 meters above the ground. All right, so I just wanted to um, just show you where we are. This is the road, the road, the Kalidon Road. The R, I think it's the 321. Um, but doesn't matter. This is the this is the Toa Road, and there is the river, the Ombres River, coming down. And I want you just to concentrate on that arrow and that tree top over there. So there's the tree top. Okay, and what you're seeing um, is exactly the same. This is just the thermal imagery from the previous photograph. Now the colors identify the areas where the heat is emanating from. Those are the colors. From the ground, the intense pink spots over here actually shows that there is a higher density or an increased amount of heat emanating from these particular areas. Um, these sites suggesting that those areas are much hotter than the other sites. But this is basically the spread of the underground fire. It was a little bit more um, down towards the sea that way as well, but um, this was the, the largest impacted area. We later found that those sites indeed, when we actually did um, on-site measuring, temperature measuring, we found that they were definitely the hot spots. Um, and we actually used a temperature gauge to um, at about 30 centimeters into the cracks and we found that it was really almost 400 degrees Celsius. So you can imagine that deeper into the ground, because peat, you know, we've already measured the peat at about um, 7 meters to 12 meters, that that was the heat underneath could at least be four times more um, than what we were, were finding um, on, on the ground. So because of the intensity of this fight, it's uh, practically impossible to douse it with conventional techniques, firefighting techniques. The river was very dry and the little rain that fell after the 11th of January fire, fire was not enough to fill the water table, and which is, um, which is what we needed actually to dose the fire from the underground up. So we also found out from one of our landowners that the site did burn in 2006, and then it took over a year without any intervention before the fire was eventually extinguished by a very wet rainy um, season that followed. Unfortunately, we were still in a very dry year cycle and we knew that we would not get this fire under control purely because the environmental conditions was against us. So once again, we needed to pull in the specialists. And there we go. On 26 March 2019, we called in the Working on Fire program, a fire specialist, Mr. Bol Martin Bolton, there he is, um, with, um, and some of the other members of the Working on Fire program to discuss a way forward for the implementation of the operational plan to extinguish the ombre subsurface fires before this. So on 29 April, the Working on Fire teams received their first training. And here, um, Dr. Um, Mr. Martin Bolton is training them on how to use the spike tool. There it's in his hand. And the spike tool is basically a pipe that has a, um, a sharp end at the bottom to penetrate the soil with a lot, a little bit of hole, a couple of holes in them, um, where the water is then pressurized through. Um, Mr. Bolton is a tool that he is specially designed for peat fires in Indonesia, and it was very successful there. He obviously had to adapt it a little bit for our area. Um, but with this tool, we had a couple of these tools, and with this tool, the um, working on fire was committed to get this fire under control in 53 days. Well, that's why 53 days, because that's the money that we had available at that time worked out at 53 days. Um, so between the agreed partnership, um, of the Overstrand Municipality, the Department of Environmental Affairs, Wetlands in our M program, the Working for Wetlands, Working on Fire, um, the Enviro Wild Fire, and of course our three landowners agreed that, that the Working on Fire team consisting of 25 men members could set up base at Camp Hill Farm, and they started on the 1st of May using some of these spike tools supported by additional hoses. So the spike tool, how it works is you can see over here is we also put up some portable dams on site and then the water was pumped 
basically um, Camp Hill has a pipeline from the dam onto their property. And then we had pumped the water from that pipeline into the portable dams. And then from the portable dams, we pumped it into these hoses that you can see over here, which is connected to the tool. And then the water gets basically pressurized through um, the spike tool. And here you can see the spike tool is, is placed into the ground. You can see the steam coming out. The guys are in full protective gear because that seam, as you can imagine, is piping, piping hot. Um, but I am happy to say that we had a very small incident with a person that had a slight steam burn on their arm. Um, and that basically, um, they realized that they had to have much longer gloves, which they then ensured that everyone got. But the person wasn't seriously injured. So as you can see, two pumps um, with two spike tools per pump. We used to extinguish the burning peat. Water was also pumped from the portable pools that we set up and we could actually move um, to the various sites um, on, the, on the ground. An area of 800 square meters received basically our main focus. As I showed you earlier on, that was the hot spots identified through the thermal imagery. A series of nine holes were made per square meter and drilled into the ground with a spike to wet the fire basically from the bottom up. After only four weeks, we saw a significant decrease in the intensity of the underground fire by using comparative before and after thermal imagery provided by Robbie Rasmus. Using this technique, we were slowly but surely winning the fight against the subsurface fire by rewetting the peat below the surface, cooling it down, and dosing the fire by effectively drowning it. The following dates, just to show, um, indicates, indicates the thermal imagery taken. Um, these photographs will follow now. A total of 15 surveys at no charge from um, Robin Rasmus were undertaken over an 11 month period to determine and monitor the extent of the situation that we were dealing with. In December 2019, Enviro Wildfire was appointed by the Overstrand Municipality to conduct a survey of the area to identify the remaining smoldering areas after the working for water um, team after their 53 days moved out of the area and this report I will refer to just now. I'm just going to show you a couple of slides. We started on the on the 8th of February 2019 and this was before the working for, tea, working for water team moved in and um, these are comparative slides. So this is the aerial photograph and then this is the thermal imagery of exactly the same. Um, we used temperatures of 25 degrees to 45 degrees and the drone was at about 100 meters above the soil, above the ground. So there's the river and there's the river and um, it basically shows you where the hotspots were. This was on the 19th of February and what we found is that with, we could see the fire was actually growing under the soil and the heat with intensity was spreading and growing. On the 19th of Feb, we realized this is a, this is a different angle. There is a road there on your right hand side. You can see that where the river is flowing, it's, it's cool, but there where it's not, we've got a, quite an increase in the fire intensity and the fire was actually moving towards the road, which was a big concern for us because we were worried that the fire could burn underneath the road and then we could have collapse of, of this heavily used road. This shows you the fire after. Remember, the working on fire team started on the 1st of May. And this shows you also at 100 meters off the ground that there was actually, to us, it showed that we made such a huge impact that there was no fires anymore. But we then realized, wait, we are still seeing smoke emanating up from the, from the soil. So something's going on underneath that we couldn't see. And um, we lowered the temperatures um, on the thermal drone. And then yes, Bob's your uncle, we actually saw that there were still fires underneath and obviously much deeper under the ground than we expected. So what we did is we basically did on site again with the fire department and the environmental section, we would visit the site every day and um, between the two departments, we ensured that we had teams that would go on 
with the spike trained teams. Um, we had our own small working on fire team that we used every day. If we find anything visible from the soil or anything from a thermal imagery, we would go into that specific site and we would dose the fire. So on the 25th of June, with the lower temperatures, we um, we came to the conclusion that we we almost there. Um, but we were not convinced yet. So on the 2nd of October, we actually asked uh, Rob to please go fly the much lower height and to even lower the temperatures more and then we picked it up. This is stumps, this is a blue gum tree, that stumps lying over there and it showed you that there was still underground fire um, in this area and there's just, a, there's just a zoom in on those specific sites. You can see that's the concentration. Here you see nothing, you don't see smoke or anything, but you can see there's a concentration of fire under the ground. Right, so on the 27th of November, um, a couple of, a little while later, we, like I said, we still monitored the site every single day, early morning. We were out there six, seven o'clock in the morning because that, when it's very cool, was the best time to see whether there was smoke emanating from the ground. And um, here we can see, I don't know if you can see this little white spot, and we saw right there's some more smoke coming up. And actually, when we put on our thermal imagery, we could see that there was actually more spots. And if you zoom in to that site, then you can see there's the smoke. And this is also a nice photograph to show you some of the cracks that um, is on the site. And this, of course, was black wattle invasive species that was coming up. So just keep this photo um, in mind when I go to the next slide. That shows you the area that was used. Um, this is a Google Earth of the color, the dots indicate the it's just approximate reference points that you can use for the next slide as well to show what was the site that we concentrated on. Um, the thermal imagery um, is of the 5th of March um, before we started. Um, just to show you, remind you again of the extent of the fire. Right, so that is still the same area that I've just showed you on the previous slide. And this was part of the report that we asked um, Rob Fry, uh, uh, Rob, Rob Fry is talking about me, um, Robbie Rasmus to um, do for us. And um, what he did is he took these, this is flight, um, flight patterns. And he used the thermal drone to start with um, what we called um, yeah, the flight patterns to basically see um, which of the, to cover the entire area to see where we still had um, underneath uh, fires. And then when in the areas where those underneath fires were identified, like in the next slide, um, that's nicely zoomed in. Um, what they did is they um, I just want to show you there, you can see the temperature setting um, of the um, drone is minimum of 29 degrees and, and maximum of 33 degrees. And the actual, as he zoomed in, the temperature showed of that specific site showed 200 degrees Celsius above the ground. So that is the site that you just saw on the um, thermal imagery. And just to show you, this is how they basically zoomed in in those sites, then they would mark those sites with hazard tape, um, and then they would actually go to that site and they would measure with a, a temperature gauge, gauge. So there was three sites um, that they did additional tests on, and they found that with a temperature gauge that these fires were actually burning less than three meters below the surface. So now we at least knew that the fire wasn't burning deeper than three meters. So um, it was easy for us then to go in with uh, adapted spike tools where, where we put connections, longer connections on that spike tool. That spike tool is about 1.5 meters long. Um, and then we put the connections on to make it just over three meters to make sure that we could dose those fires from the bottom up. 
So the information, this report was submitted to the fire department and the environmental section. So we continued. We never left the site alone. We were there every day. We continued to monitor the site. And over the next six, six weeks from that time, a total of four follow-up visits were undertaken by Rob to visit the, um, with his thermal imagery, to visit the site to make sure that um, the area was definitely under control. Now, on the morning of the 5th of February, 2020, at 5.30 in the morning was the last time that um, hotspots or smoldering fire underground were identified. And um, we then considered that the fire was extinguished. But we continued um, our inspections until the 8th of April. Um, and that was actually the day that we realized that there's definitely no more underground fire and the fire incident was eventually closed on the 8th of April 2020. This is a nice photograph also, it almost looks like a, something that doesn't belong on our planet. But um, this photo is from the 26th of November 2019. Um, there was also a wetland rehabilitation planning team consisting of engineers and wetland ecologists, environmental management practitioners, working on wetlands provincial coordinator, our landowners affected and overstrand planned the phase two of the operation, which was the physical wetland rehabilitation of the site. This planning document is not finalized yet and it still needs to be submitted, but it will include soft and hard um, rehabil rehabilitation and interventions to restore, to get some function restoration or rehabilitation rather back to our system. In early January 2020, our landowners, um, Campiel and Hamilton Russell, um, both the Campiel community and the Campiel community farm and the Campiel school together with the Omeris Conservancy and Landcare um, started with the clearing of invasive species on, on the site. I apologize that I don't have a um, aerial photograph of that on this slide presentation, um, but um, I can assure you all of that, um, that invasive species has been removed. There's a little bit coming up again. And um, the land team, the landowners, and the wetlands um, organizations are very committed to make sure that that sites are kept clean of invasive species. A lot of the material that was actually removed from the site um, was packed on the banks of the of the Ormus estuary and on the Campbell farm to ensure that these um, sticks and logs and brought branch material can later be used as soft surface um, or uh, soft uh, material for the uh, restoration of the wetland. From the beginning of the project also uh, Dr. Althea Grundling um, from the Agricultural Research Centre mentioned that she would be very interested in conducting research on the palmit and the peak wetland, obviously because it's such a unique system. So on the 1st of April 2020, the research project on peat loss and management and rehabilitation protocols were launched. Preliminary site visits uh, were held on the 23rd of June, of which the Overstrand municipality was part, and field work started um, on the 24th of June um, as an initial introduction to the project. So the main tasks of this research that will be very important for us is to show um, the potential loss of peat and compare that with three peatland sites in South Africa by establishing the extent of peatland desiccation and the loss of peat through erosion of fire and then to identify the ecosystem services that peatlands historically provided to the affected communities and to assess then the losses and the impact of these fires on these desiccated peat and burned peatlands and, and the hope is that, that this study will ensure a much greater involvement and protection status for our these very unique um, wetland systems in, in our country. The um, PhD students or student that's going to work on this um, on this study will be looking at the um, peat core. You'll be taking peat core samples um, and do carbon analysis of those. You'll be 
we are doing transects in the healthy system, in the in the impacted system, um, and he's going to run this project. Going to be run and funded by the ARC for the next three years. So the last and the final phase of for the restoration of this system is um, what we like to call the catchment to coach approach. And on the 21st of January, in the beginning of this year, the Overstrand signed a letter of support towards the Galas Biodiversity Init Initiative, Abbey, to act as the facilitator for the um, Greater Overberg Fund project. The Ormus River catchment was identified as a pilot project under the Greater Overberg Water Fund program, and further discussions and data collection is currently taking place in order to develop the status quo and the scoping report for the entire catchment from the top right down to the bottom up to the estuary mouth. The objective of the Water Fund is to bring together private and public sector stakeholders alongside our local communities around the common goal of restoring the surface water and aquifer catchments with supply of water. So the Water Fund aims to support and align with existing government initiatives and to act as a catalyst for systematic change in catchment management by cost-effective use of and on the ground water resources, strengthening capacity, robust monitoring and evaluation. So in addition, the Water Fund will stimulate funding and implement um, and implementation of catchment restoration efforts and in the process create jobs and momentum to protect globally important biodiversity and to build more resilient communities in the face of climate change. It will include alien invasive plant removal and system restoration of the Umrus catchment. In the case of the Umrus and the wetland restoration, the Water Fund will support the working on wetlands program with additional funding support to ensure the recovery of the ecosystem function that assists with the natural storage and filtering of the water resources in our system. So wetlands are important, of course, for our catchment hydrology, increasing groundwater infiltration and attenuation, water attenuation and surface flows and sediment loads and reducing downstream damages during storm events. So it's got a huge, huge ecosystem function that the system plays within the, um, in the almost catchment. It retains nutrients and it removes pathogens. Wetlands also prevent the development of algal growth that deteriorate downstream water quality and thereby reduce our additional water treatment costs. So the rehabilitation of the upstream catchment and wetland system will ultimately improve the condition of our almost estuary. The siltation, the water quality issues and the excessive reed growth in the estuary are all just symptoms of this imbalance at the top end of our catchment and our wetland system. So I believe that each I believe that the only way to restore our rehabilitation of uh, the system is to ensure that we have an associated ecosystem approach um, of catchment to coast where everyone in the community from the top to the bottom is involved in a process where we can basically, um, as I would like to call it, save our almost estuary, um, our almost wetland system. And that's me. Wonderful, Lisa, thank you very much. Just to yeah. clarify the last part of your talk. Yes, yes. Will this initiative also deal with the illegal abstraction of water and illegal structures and dams? Yes, yes it will. We are, one of the partners that will be pulled in is um, the Breda Chorit Scatchment Management Agency. As, as well as Department of Water and Sanitation, who approves these dams and who is also supposed to regulate illegal dams. So they will be in, in also brought into the system and they will be monitored, basically record uh, or data um, being developed to see which of those are legal and not and, and, and or legal. You mentioned a few times that this system is unique. Is it unique in South Africa or is it unique in the world? And are Peat systems like this a, a general occurrence in many parts of the world? As I, as I understand from Big Louis, with, with just the initial assessment, uh, there hasn't been a full assessment done of the Omris yet. So that's what they're trying to do now um, with a PhD student. Um, but like I said, the peat wetland is the third deepest in our country. Peat 
wetlands are not normally associated with farm meat systems. And I think that's where the uniqueness comes in. Normally, when you have farm meat, it doesn't mean that you're going to have peat and the other way around. So I think the specialists are the guys that will be able to, once they start researching more into this specific system, they will be able to, to tell us why this specific system is so incredibly unique as they suspect. One final question from me before I open it up. How does the oxygen reach the fires when they burn so low down in the system? Well, this is what the fire department explained to me is that they think with these cracks that are opened up into the system, although methane, the CO2 and those things are ex that are being um, excluded by the um, fire, they still felt that because the cracks are so many and so incredibly big, I mean, some of those cracks were huge, it was actually dawn that, that that was how the fire was actually feeding itself because there was actually enough oxygen that was entering through those specific cracks. Okay, thank you. John Brister, you have your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Gert, and thanks, Liesl, for an excellent presentation, and credit to all the people who've actually um, pretty well put out that fire. And just a couple of questions. Is the plan to take out all, or most, or hopefully all of the exotic species up and down that, that drainage? I mean, if you look around the area and drive past it, there's still a lot of exotic trees, gum and, and pine sort of further up and along the sidelines. Um, uh, wattle. So, so that's the first question. The, the, the second is more just a comment, and I see Peter van Niekerk's on on the the talk, and and you know it's a bit of a curveball to you. I, I find it interesting, you know, the illegal takeoff of, of water and the illegal building of dams up the valley is sort of common talk in the town. Everyone talks about it and has a good laugh, and yet we have all that, you know, we have all sorts of acts and regulations and and um, laws that should be upheld and most of all implemented. And I think sadly it's symptomatic of South Africa. We have all, all of this law that we can use, but it never gets used. So, so surely, you know, someone's got to start taking the bull by the horns and becoming unpopular and actually, you know, showing up some of the culprits so we actually see some action and incredibly valuable um, system. So that, those are my two points for comment. Uh, thank you, John. Yes, the the whole idea with the Water Fund project, um, I don't know if you guys have heard about it, you probably have, the Greater Cape Town Water Fund um, yeah. is international funding that comes through together with the City of Cape Town and some other role players of government, um, working on wetlands, working on fire, etc., working for water, that is running that program to to clean the catchments and to look at the illegal um, extraction of water in the catchments to restore those systems for water security in the city. So the water, when I contacted, I was very lucky that I know the lady in South Africa that deals with um, Louise Stafford, that deals with the um, water fund or runs the water fund on this side. I said to her, please come and have a look at the Ormus issue because I think we've got something similar happening here that I would like you to be involved with. And she jumped at it and she said it's such a, with Big Louis information, she realized that it's such a unique system that we need to um, invest into this area. So it was also a very nice small project, catchment to coast. It's only a 17 kilometer from the top down to the bottom. Um, and the idea is to in, to look at the major in-stream inflow into the Ormus and of course the Ormus mainstream as well. Right from the bottom, right to the, to the top. First of all, look at the 30 meter from the water's edge to clean everything from 30 meters from the water's edge and then slowly but surely as landowners have interest and they, they assist with funding, etc then um, the area will go much wider. But yes, to remove everything um, slowly but surely from the, from the top to the bottom, but first to concentrate on the, on the wetland, of course, and to, to restore that system. Because you want to have that system restored before you clean everything in the top catchment and everything, and, and the system can't deal with the water that's coming through. And so that is the, that is the idea. It's, it's just, a, like I said, it's a scoping report. It's just the initial. We don't know what it's going to cost yet. We haven't discussed anything with landowners yet. 
We're just trying to get all the data <coughs> together now. And once we have that, then we will start talking to all the landowners. Peter, you have your hand up. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, and uh, well done, uh, Liesl, that it was very interesting. The catchment management agency, their head office is in Worcester, but they're basically an agency for the Department of Water and Sanitation, the old water affairs. Yeah. And uh, they have a section called Compliance Monitoring and Enforcement, which is a legal uh, section, and they're looking into the legality of water abstractions. If they, have, if they get a, a complaint or, a, or somebody notifies them of something that is amiss, then they investigate and they, uh, you know, like all legal processes, these things do move slowly because they want to be absolutely sure of their facts and uh, their case before they take action. I've been in contact with them for uh, various reasons and they tell me that they are investigating a number of what they think are illegal uh, abstractions or dam, dams that have been constructed. So that is on the go in the, the whole of the catchment of, of, of well, of the Honours River catchment above the Boss Dam as well as below the, the Boss Dam. Yeah, thank, thanks, Pete. I've lived in the minus for three and a half years and I'm still the cynic. You know, it's like the Zondo Commission, which has been going two years and no one's appeared in orange overalls yet. Anyway, that's that's for another discussion. Right. Yeah, thanks. I've got another curveball for Peter. Peter, I'm on uh, your URF, your forum for the estuary at the bottom there. Why haven't we heard of this fund yet? Is it a secret fund? What is the size of it? Why are we in the dark in terms of the plans of this bigger plan? Or is this something that's just come onto the table? I am also in the dark, Henny. Uh, I have not heard of this. Uh, I have heard of the uh, coast, uh, the catchment to coast initiative, but I suppose the fund is now something more recent. And, you know, we had a break because of COVID and all that, where we had communication problems. So that, that particular piece of information hasn't reached our shores yet. And that is now the Andres River Estuary Forum, the shore. Lisa, can you comment on the fund? Yes, I can. The reason why we haven't come to see the RF or the other land users um, yet is because we want to have our facts straight. We would like to put something on the table. Um, like I said, we are currently working with the Water Fund to get all the data together. The data means we're looking at all the landowners, who are the landowners directly impacting on um, the Oris estuary, who are, where is the, what is the um, status of the invasive species, that's all being mapped. Um, and when we have money, when we have financials on the table, when we can say, right, the Water Fund has this amount of million, they can start at this point um, and then we can start negotiating with, with the landowners, etc. to say what can the landowners, what financial, and it won't be a lot of money, it, it could even be in kind, but we need to go sit down with all landowners to discuss that. But the moment that we have the go ahead from the Water Fund to say, all right, now we can meet with the RF, now we can sit down with the Overstrand Municipality, to look at water tariffs but from our side, but we need to in, in, um, in, um, give in, in um, financials, then we will be able to, be, to come to you on the table say, this is where we are, this is where we have. I don't want to come to the table with a dream. I don't want to come with something to you where I don't have answers. I think that's wasting everyone's time. So my idea is to come to you with a, with a proper proposal. Henny, does that answer your question? Uh, in a way, yes, but I'm just a little bit concerned that we may be pulling in different directions here because uh, it'll come to the point where, for instance, I've been in discussion with people with lots of money who've got it available, and then they'll say, but why didn't you come to us earlier? Why didn't you tell us about this? If we pull together on this one, we can actually get a lot of money there fast. I have um, included our board councillor, Jean, right from the beginning, from the start. I think he also feels that, um, he probably also feels let us get something um, tangible on the table before it's actually discussed. Um, 
so it's not like we have not um, informed through the processes we definitely have but I think he also probably I don't know if he's on the on here now but if, if he wants to make a comment I didn't see him but um, I think when he's comfortable that we have something to put on the table but if it's required then any and if you're saying that um, um, there's this information that you and I know what you're talking about um, I just don't know I, I'm actually unsure how we can fit that together at this point because like I said we haven't spoken finances with the water fund yet but if you would like to give me a call or if you would like to have a zoom meeting or pop in my office which is fine after I put you through a rigid COVID-19 test then you're welcome to pop in and then we can see how we can fit these things together okay John you have your hand up again yeah, just to come back on a positive, I, I mean, I, and I think Henny's raised an important point. I mean, Hermanus and Overberg does some amazing work, you know, compared to the municipalities where I still have an involvement or we, we live, there's no comparison. But, but we need to, or, or Liesl and, you know, the, the municipality need to communicate all this great stuff. You know, the, the work that's gone on. Um, in in the in the peat is, is amazing and as I said credit to everyone so so I, I think um, I think you're basically underselling yourself and and what I'd like to ask too we have a very active and Henny and Peter and others are part of an active um, Oberberg geoscientist group and we're looking to sort of set up a, a geo trail so to speak including up the Himmel and Arda Valley and while you're doing all that great work in the in the peat beds, wouldn't you think about sort of identifying a spot or or, or a place that we could um, you know stop cars on the side of the road or people could get out and actually go and look at this amazing um, situation, um, this peatland, you know, even to the point of having a boardwalk that people could walk over it and actually see firsthand what's what's there in the Himalayanada Valley. Um, as I say, my parting shot, I, I think we, over, we undersell all of this good, good work that goes on in the Overberg and particularly that's driven by, you know, people in the minus, including the municipality. So that's my, my tuppence for the day. Thanks. Thank you, John. Liesl? Thank you, John. I like that idea of road walk. I love that. Um, you're absolutely right. We do undersell ourselves. I think it's because we try and work as much under the line out of the limelight um, but we definitely work hard, hard behind the scenes I agree with you and um, that we need to communicate better that's my fault I I'm, I'm I normally just try and get things done um, and and you're right the partnership is, is incredibly important um, I I've learned that lesson before and I agree with you that that's something that we need to continue and, and work to, myself to improve with um, I like the idea of the boardwalk. I would like to talk to you about that, or, or whoever wants to talk to me about that further. And um, there is actually a that's a very dangerous road. Cars drive extremely fast there, but yeah. there is actually a, a, a parking area just to the right, opposite that site, where we, one can actually park the car. Then, but then you need to cross the road, and if you stand there, you can see um, the entire thing. But I think a safe pack because a safe pack. Would, would be a very good idea. So yeah, I would yeah. definitely. I've written that down, uh, John. Thank you. Okay, so so just as you know, Henny and Peter and I and some others are going to come and see you or to set up a Zoom talk. Sure. Great. I think we've come to the end of this discussion. There are many things that need to be followed up. Thank you very very much, Liesl, for the presentation, for the way you've answered these questions, and there are obviously some issues that need to be followed up. Thank you for those of you who participated. I'm going to end the meeting now. Goodbye.